Hey everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and today I will be lamenting over not getting into Miss Fisher's murder mystery sooner than I did. As you can imagine, everyone was on my case about this show and for good reason. It is perfect for me. I don't know why I was so against watching it for so long. Probably because despite being in my mid-30s and a strong, mature woman who occasionally cracks a raunchy joke or two, I have the defiance of my hard-headed grandma. She's dead, but I carry the torch for all these stubborn ladies who don't like to cook and prefer gambling and profanity. The more people who suggested this series to me, the more my salty brain responded with, You don't know me. I'll watch what I want when I want. Humph. Then promptly drowned myself in episodes of Unsolved Mysteries that I have seen twice over, but that's just how I do. Finally, after a third attempt, one of my friends got me to watch the series because it was being taken down on Netflix. This was his third attempt, and there were many exclamation points in the message, so I finally decided to watch it. I managed to get through the first season before it was removed, then bought the rest of them on DVD since I felt immediately smitten with the series. So smitten, in fact, that I'm writing a video about it. I'll be going over the basic premise of the show, why it fits perfectly in the genre of murder mystery, and the sexual prowess of its dynamic lead character, Phryne Fisher. Since I'm only through the first season of the show, my review will be focusing on that, and there will be minor spoilers, so please keep that in mind. Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries is an Australian show starring Essie Davis and based on the Phryne Fisher detective books by Carrie Greenwood. I haven't read the books yet, but the series has definitely intrigued me, and I have a feeling that it actually did the character of Phryne justice. Terribly fashionable, unmistakably glamorous, handy with a pistol. Have you met Phryne Fisher? Why do you think you can just run off on your own? Because I'm carrying a gun. Yep, checks out. Initially, I thought people were calling her Franny instead of Phryne, since I didn't think Phryne was a common name in 1920s Melbourne. According to the books, she was meant to be named Psyche from the story Cupid and Psyche. It was chosen for her before her christening, but was accidentally named after the Greek courtesan Phryne because her dad forgot. Phryne is Greek for toad. Why do dads always mix this stuff up? I swear, my dad nearly got my name mixed up when I was born. Had my mom not noticed, I would have been named Christy. Just like the books, the show takes place during the late 20s and boasts a very decadent aesthetic. It's shot dramatically and the costuming is beautiful, terribly glamorous indeed. After living abroad for several years, Phryne Fisher moves back to Australia and works as a detective, willing to solve any case that comes her way and willing to charm and seduce men as she sees fit. There are several characters in the series, including Phryne's house workers, Mr. Butler, the butler, Dorothy, the maid, and Inspector Jack Robinson, who is reluctant to work with Phryne at first but gradually warms up to her. This is the scene of a crime. Well, lucky for you, I'm wearing gloves. There is also Hugh, a clever constable, Jane, a wayward girl who shares the name of Phryne's deceased sister, a couple dock workers, and several of Phryne's personal friends that recur. The show is set up like many crime and or detective shows. A murder happens, it needs to be solved, there's some red herrings and twists along the way, and then BAM, you have an episode. There is an overarching story that involves Phryne and her sister, but the majority of the series is made up of individual mysteries that are not related. This is a very common setup, you see it all the time in crime shows, Murder, She Wrote, Columbo, Sherlock, they all follow this format. The unique aspects of a murder mystery or crime show have become its characters and the murders, because as far as structure, I don't see it deviating. Setting a mystery in the 20s is fairly common in literature and visual media. It's a perfect era to write crime about because we see it so nostalgically and everything related feels so lavish and scandalous. I surmise it was not as whimsical as current pop culture media makes it out to be, but there's definitely a lot to take inspiration from. It's also the decade that contributed some of the most important important works of mystery. There were a lot of prime writers adding to the expanding genre, most notably Edward Stratton Meyer, creator of The Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, and Agatha Christie, the best-selling novelist of all time. Not only is the decade heavily romanticized, but it's also easier to write crime during a time when technology would be so limited. No one is digging through texts or Facebook messages here, so one can take their time fleshing out the mystery part of it, giving the detectives greater challenges and plot twists. Miss Fisher reminded me of The Dagger of Amon Ra, a game which is also set in the 1920s with a great Art Deco style and dramatic characters. Just the font gets me excited. The font! If I may be candid, I view murder mystery as kind of a dying genre. Did I really just say that? Ha ha ha, murder mystery, dying, clever. It's not that it's fully dead, it's a little undead. Every now and then it'll pop back up and we'll see something really good, then quietly go back into hibernation. 
I think I just described a bear zombie. It's not the popular form of entertainment it used to be, and it makes sense. Times change, we evolve, our interests stray. So when I see a really promising murder mystery pop up, I cling to it like wet clothes, and Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries was my next warm body. Aside from setting, costumes, and the cozy nature of these episodes, one of the biggest reasons I enjoyed Miss Fisher's is because the lead character is a boss. The owner was very eager to get us out of there. That wouldn't have anything to do with you barging in there like a freight train, would it? I was a charming freight train. She lives in a glamorous house with red iron filigree gates and dresses to impress on the daily. She has the perception of Jessica Fletcher and the sexual appeal of James Bond, except she's more confident than the former and a lot less creepy than the latter. It was honestly very refreshing seeing such a strong, mature woman in this role because traditionally, mystery has been a white man's world. And while there's been an effort to add more diversity over time, you can still blatantly see its shortcomings. I'm, I'm afraid this won't do. Uh, I, I have never seen a woman set foot inside this building in my time. Primarily in the quirky male trope, you know the one, where the lead has many quirks, easy to mimic behaviors and body language. Maybe they have a drug or alcohol problem or obsessive compulsive tendencies. I took all the letters off and I put them back in alphabetical order. Why? They were mixed up. One of my personal favorite quirky detectives is Columbo. I like his mannerisms and his ability to get answers with basic conjectures versus forensics. He's quite the social engineer, that Columbo. But as much as I love some of these quirky male detectives, they saturate the market. Jessica Fletcher has always been a great character to me, though she was never officially a detective, unlike Phryne, whose business is being a lady detective, as she describes. To my oldest friend's newest enterprise, the Honorable Miss Fisher, Lady Detective. <laughs> I also like my fair share of Miss Marple, but there's something different about Phryne. She's had a lot of interesting experiences in her life that make her strong, not bitter, and she's very sexually charged. I haven't seen such sexual energy from an older female character since Blanche from The Golden Girls. Usually when I see very confident women in murder mystery series, they are the femme fatale type. Beautiful, sexually charged women who were often the untrustworthy characters, the ones that seduce and seek revenge. But Phryne just enjoys the company of young men, and it's never used against her or looked at as a bad thing, a flaw, or otherwise. In fact, the character doesn't have many blatant flaws that I could really dig into. Surely a character this in tune with who they are and this intelligent must have a terrible, dark secret or personality flaw, or they're just too cocky for their own good and can use some practice and humility. Her confidence and intelligence is looked at as a good thing, part of her character. Why do all of these detective types need to be flawed to be relatable? I'm not against flawed characters in principle, giving a character problems and goals to work through often creates a more fleshed out character. I'm just getting tired of seeing it done again and again. And that isn't to say that Phryne doesn't have quirks or darkness in her past, because she's absolutely gone through some heartbreaking things. However, I got the impression early on that she handles her emotions more responsibly than most. She's dedicated and genuinely giving and helpful to anybody who comes into her life. And fashion. She's very dedicated to personal style, especially hats. It was poison. I'll bet my hat on it. The closest thing to a flaw would be her grief over the kidnapping of her little sister Janie, which happened when they were children. She does place a little blame on herself, but I don't consider that a personality flaw as much as she simply went through something traumatic that bolstered her desire to solve crime. Instead of resulting in something cliche like alcoholism or drug use, she instead puts her energy into helping people with their problems, and she is very good at it. The season one finale definitely dives into her more vulnerable side, but I was impressed at how quickly the character bounces back in season two. I think there's a lot of parallels between Phryne and Jessica Fletcher from Murder, She Wrote. There wasn't a big emphasis on sexual empowerment, and Fletcher was not as flamboyant or packing heat, but she was extremely clever, perceptive, and had a firm attitude. And they both both love to snoop in places they shouldn't be. But even with those comparisons, I still found Phryne to be unique in the murder mystery category. I love her rendezvous with men, I love her intelligence, and I love that sick as hell black bob. On top of having a stellar protagonist, I also really love the other main characters and Phryne's interactions with them. She's great at passive aggressively trying to help people out, including the very pure in heart constable, Hugh Collins. A notable moment for me is during the first part of season one, where Hugh develops a crush on Dorothy, Phryne's maid. For the most part, it's very syrupy. Hugh Collins, more like Hugh Grant with the way he flusters about. I... I was wondering if... I mean, would you... 
Phryne observes that he wants to romance Dorothy in some way, but he's young and inexperienced, so she gives him a book that resembles the Kama Sutra and blatantly tells him there's an entire section dedicated to kissing. And he is like, oh my god. But he takes it with him anyway. <laughs> The women in the series are also extremely badass. I love Dr. McMillan, who makes an appearance in several cases, and I like how courageous and determined Dorothy, affectionately nicknamed Dot, becomes over the span of season one. I found her somewhat annoying in the early episodes, but being in Franny's presence on the daily impacts her positively, and in several episodes she becomes involved in the cases. I do enjoy the dynamic between the serious inspector, Jack Robinson, and Phryne, but his character doesn't get fleshed out very well. I think he will be as I get through the seasons, but so far I know very little about him. I am intrigued by the continual sexual tension between him and Phryne, but I'm mostly enjoying the more friendship-style banter they often have when they're working together. You really can't go around removing evidence from a corpse. I'll try and remember that next time. Am I forgiven? Provisionally. Like most shows in this style, Jack is initially irked with her personal investigations and reluctant to accept her help, but by the end she has his respect in what seems to be his affections. I'm actually kind of tired of this trope, especially since it's so common in cozy or soft-boiled murder mysteries. It's always a meddling woman and a stubborn male detective, and he's always irritated at first, but she proves herself and then they fall in love. Happens all the time. But I think it's executed well in Miss Fisher's, and it has just the right pacing and a good amount of serious writing that keeps the romantic interactions in check. It's a good balance. I will say this though, season one's finale certainly goes places. It was a little jarring. We get bits and pieces of some of Phryne's backstory with the disappearance of her sister, and it all gets smashed into the finale. It takes a wild turn I never saw coming that entails Egyptology. Mystery writers sure do love that, don't they? I could write another whole video on how writers use ancient Egypt in their plots. As for the murders themselves, they're pretty well done. I thought a couple were more intense than others, but for the most part, they're consistently written. Another trope that often gets overused is when the main character is chased by a serial killer that they have a personal issue with. In this case, it's the man who kidnapped Phryne's sister, Janie. He breaks out of prison and stalks her with intent to kill anyone who was responsible for his sentence. It's a classic plot in the thriller and noir genres and I'm pretty tired of seeing the same elements creep back into mystery again and again, especially when the stalkers also turn out to be like expert surgeons or doctors. Good lord, that shit is everywhere. For whatever reason, I didn't mind it as much in Miss Fisher's and that might be because it's a modern take on a classic format, so even though it does recycle ideas, they do seem fresh and compelling to watch. Despite a few cliches here and there, I do think this is a great murder mystery series with a confident protagonist and a classic feel. As I mentioned previously, it was recently taken off Netflix, but you can still find it on YouTube, Amazon, or you can just purchase the DVDs. Let me know what you think about this series in the comments, and until next time, happy sleuthing. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching my video on Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries. I hope it inspires many nights of watching it while cuddled up on a comfy couch with a hot chocolate. If you want more murder mystery related content, I have it in spades, but first, why not share some of that hot chocolate fund with me via Patreon? Yes, Patreon, where you can give me, the creator, small amounts of financial support so I can keep solving mysteries and keep the channel going strong. If you don't have the means to support me in a monetary sense, no worries. Liking this video, commenting, and sharing also means means so much to me. Right, mystery videos. On the left we have a spicy episode of Murder She Wrote, and on the right we have an episode of The Golden Girls, both heavy on the cheese and on the crime. I always recommend subscribing and hitting the bell thingy as well so you know when I release a new video. Thank you again, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.